Hi, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Kieran Gill. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We're going to wait a couple of minutes just while we kind of wait for everyone to filter in. Um, before we start doing introductions and, and all sorts of things, um, you'll see on the screen share at the moment, there is a link to a Mentimeter poll. Uh, just give us a bit of feedback throughout the session. I think there's something like four or five questions throughout the session. So um, nothing too strenuous, um, kind of one button click answers. So uh, if you don't mind grabbing your phone, uh, scanning, that, uh, scanning that QR code um, just gives us a bit of advice and, and some feedback. Um, and people are still pouring in, I can see. And if you don't have a phone, the link has also been posted into the chat by Spencer. So feel free to, to do it that way as well. So a lot of people coming in, really like it, excited. So those of you that have just joined, uh, welcome. Um, this is our very first, we're really, really excited about this, to be honest. It, it's our first What's New Live to the public that we're doing. Um, so thank you for, for taking the time to come and see it and, and be part of it. Um, those of you that aren't already aware, there's a, there's a link on the screen, which you can take your phone out, scan, just gives us a bit of feedback. Only four or five questions, nice and simple and straightforward. So go ahead and fill that out. And if you don't have your phone with you, there's a link that's been posted in the chat, which you can click on and do exactly the same thing. A um, little bit of housekeeping really is, uh, you'll see there's a little chat button or a Q and A button in your kind of Zoom toolbar. Feel free to drop us a question at any time. If there's any questions you have on anything you're seeing, um, we'll endeavor to kind of pick that up um, throughout the process, but also towards the end, we'll kind of open up again to questions and answer some of the questions we haven't um, necessarily picked up or answered. Okay, so with that, I'd like to say welcome to everyone. Um, my name is Kieran Gill, and we're going to be talking today about the what's new. Now, before we do that, we've got a whole bunch of experts that are joining us today on the call. And uh, first of all, it's, it's myself on the line. I'm going to talk a little bit about the broad overarching, what's new really features that we've added in, which aren't really manufacturing specific. Um, we'll then move on to Kyle. Now, Kyle is historically a, his background really is mechanical engineering, and he's been working in uh, with different packages uh, for a very long time. Um, over six years, and he has worked with the inventor team improving the design and documentation workflows um, before coming over to the Fusion 360 team. And he's gonna be covering some of the design and documentation, what's new. So really excited to see some of that. Dylan uh, himself has been working as a machinist, uh, machine tool operator, as well as a manufacturing engineer for I think over 10 or 11 years. So a wealth of experience there for manufacturing 3D complex parts. Dylan's going to walk us through some of those new what's new features that uh, are coming in the manufacturing workspace. And then last but not least is uh, Edwin. Uh, he's our guru um, and he'll be walking through, he's our electronics guru, and he'll be walking us through the what's new in the electronics workspace. So with that, let's jump straight in. So what are the kind of key highlights for the March release? Now, if anything, if you walk away from today's session and you forget everything, the only thing I want to kind of, I want you to take away with you is these three key salient features. So let's start on the left-hand side. We have design advice. Now this is going into the product design extension in the design workspace. It's graduating from public preview to the full release and provides manufacturing insight to the designer initially for plastic design, uh, initially for plastic part design. Now, Carl's going to walk us all through that, so I'm not going to steal any of his thunder, so look out for those details um, very soon. And then kind of jumping straight into the middle block um, in manufacturing, we have some of the new functionality going into the manufacturing extension, both on the nesting side with the advanced range graduating from public preview to full release, and in the, manuf in the machine extension, we have the ability to move entry positions and toolpath trimming to boundaries or planes 
which is also graduating from preview. And then lastly, in, in electronics, we have the brand new way of placing components called the component panel. Now, this is a much more comprehensive way um, with improved search capabilities and now just is, is always visible for easier access. So some really strong um, benefits there, which, which Edwin's gonna show you a little bit later. So with that, um, let's kind of jump into some of the broad overarching kind of workspace agnostic really improvements we've made. Um, now the first one really is improvements to Mac users, especially those who use the trackpad. Historically, what we've had was a very popular add-in which allowed users to improve their experience using the trackpad on a Mac with Fusion. That add-in is no longer being maintained as it was being externally maintained by an avid Fusion 360 user. This is not the case going forward. So it was time for really the Fusion team to decide to implement our own kind of improved trackpad experience. And so we did. Um, so what happens now is that Fusion 360 receives a gesture event directly from Mac OS, which what we did previously was to get the was to get really Fusion to interpret those gestures natively. And this kind of created some issues for us. Um, now, one thing to bear in mind that this is a public preview feature, so you will need to go and turn it on. The image on the right hand side of the screen kind of shows the preferences and what that option is that you need to go and, and, and tick to make that available to you. Um, so we're hoping this is gonna give you guys a, a lot more benefit. You're gonna find more um, support from it. Those gestures are gonna come through nice, clean and sharp. So um, yeah, we're really excited for you guys to try it out. The next one really is the service utility. Now this kind of falls into the self-service set of functionality tools. And this will typically now appear upon launch of Fusion 360 when a problem has been encountered. So a really good example here, for example, is if Fusion doesn't launch properly twice in a row, then this utility will allow you to now repair, reset, or uninstall. And, and this is really useful because previously users would just uninstall the product entirely only to come back and reinstall to try and fix some of the problems they're experiencing. Now, it's also got a range of additional options on the dialog, which allow you to contact support as well as grab the required system info and diagnostics so that the problem can be more easily shared with Autodesk support teams. Um, this should certainly help users who have previously logged tickets for Fusion startup issues. Um, and yeah, we're, 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 gonna, we're thinking this is gonna make quite a, quite a huge benefit to those of you who have startup issues um, in the past. And then kind of one of the big elephants and kind of one of the big talking points in the room um, is the move to Autodesk Flex tokens. So uh, Autodesk is moving to Flex tokens and we did this on the 29th of March, so two days ago. Um, and what this really means is that cloud credits will no longer be available for purchase after the 29th of March. Um, and they will auto expire a year from now on the 29th of March, 2023. So if you bought some cloud credits on the 29th of March this year, they will auto expire one year after that. Now we think this provides significant, significantly more flexibility for accessing products and services, whether it's on a pay per day or a pay per result basis. Now the beauty here is you can choose how you spend it on, whether it's a product or whether it's a service. This isn't just a fusion implementation, it's a, it's a global Autodesk wide implementation. Now, as I said before, tokens can be spent in a variety of different ways and means access to the entire Autodesk portfolio. And now this makes a huge differentiator because you can choose on what you spend it on and how you spend it on. You can buy tokens in bundles and you can spend them on whatever you like. So it doesn't have to be fusion. It doesn't have to be spending your tokens on some of the extension functionality. If you wanted to, you could spend it on fusion for 20, 24 hours. You could spend it on Revit. You could spend it on Inventor. You choose how you use those, those tokens. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I wanted to cover there. Um, Spencer, I think, will also be posting a, a useful link which can give you more information about the, the Flex system and um, what implications it may have for you. Um, and just, just generally some more information about um, the Flex token system. Okay, so uh, one of those last big elephants in the room that I'm gonna talk about 
is the, and we're kind of diving into the, the, the manufacturing workspace a little bit here. And this is the machining extension repackaging. Now, what we've done is we've, we've updated the CAM capabilities in the manufacturer workspace um, that are available with a Fusion 360 subscription and the machining extension. Now, these changes that I'm gonna talk about now only impact milling workflows. So uh, the first of those is the interactive controls for tool orientation that were previously only available in the machining extension. So things like tilt and turn, align to view and surface normal, they will all move to the Fusion 360 core offering at no extra cost. That's really good. Now, I'm not going to steal any of Dylan's thunder because he's going to show you a lot of this later. So stay tuned for that. And then uh, Fusion 360 will continue to include two and three axis milling, turning, water jet, laser, plasma, as well as probe WCS, all in the core offering. And this goes without saying um, that we're also still including three plus one and three plus two positional milling. Um, as well in the core offering. Now, what is changing the other way, which is going into the machining extension, is all true four and five axis simultaneous machining capabilities will be moving into that extension. Now, uh, so, so these are things like SWARF, multi-axis contour, multi-axis flow, and multi-axis tilting. Um, so one thing, and I can, I can already hear the questions coming in, but what about if we use a 2D contour or a 2D uh, pocket where we use the wrap functionality. Well, we don't consider the, the wrap function for the 2D contour and 2D pocket to be true for axis um, simultaneous. So all of the wrap features or the wrap functions for the 2D pocket and 2D contour will also remain in the core Fusion 360 offering. So thumbs up there. Those of you that do have educational, personal or hobbyist licenses, um, you won't see any change at all, uh, as you won't be affected by this change at all. Uh, again, Spencer's posted a lovely link to a in-depth article um, about the repackaging. There's also a fireside chat as part of that, that link, which kind of was done by one of the directors, um, kind of just um, helping to explain why we did the changes, what was the thinking behind it. Um, so, so hopefully that gives you some good insight and also gives you some more information about um, some of the changes in the machining extension. And then lastly, so, you know, you may still have some, some further questions. So feel free to reach out to us at digitalmfg at autodesk.com. Um, and uh, yeah, ask us your questions. And, and we have a range of, of, of teams who, who look at that, that email alias and we'll get back to you. So with that, um, we've got some exciting stuff in the what's new design and documentation area. Um, I'm gonna hand over now to Kyle to, to walk us through some of that. So Kyle, over to you, sir. Awesome, thank you, Karen. So today in the what's new for design and documentation, we're gonna go through um, two really key areas that we have that's uh, new in this area. The first I really want to talk about is something that's going in the product design extension. So I did want to call that out. This is specifically for product design extension and kind of goes with the workflows we've been adding to this area. So for those of you who've been with us for a while, you probably remember in January, we, we upgraded this, this area and added some real nice functionality. And really the goal overarching the product design extension is to automate your guys's workflows by making the process a little bit more manufacturing aware. So if you've looked at the product design extension at all, you will notice that uh, we have the ability now to, to kind of identify the manufacturing process up front. And that kind of drives the design going forward and what you're going to be able to do. And some of the tools end up being automated. So the bosses, the ribs, all of this gets automated with some of the upfront manufacturing focus that we had um, in that design. Now, what we have now coming out of public preview is this new design advice. So here you can see I've got my plastic part. This is going to be for a, a speaker system that I put together, just like a little you know Bluetooth speaker that we could, could create. So over here in this plastics design, I now have this new design advice button. So here I can say, I can click the body that I wanna do. You gotta make sure that this body has this plastic rule because this is what we're checking against, right? What this is gonna do is allow you to 
check whether you have designed correctly for manufacturing. So this specifically is for plastic injection molding. The first iteration of product design extension really is targeting that plastic injection molding manufacturing process. And so a lot of those rules kind of come out of there. And so what we're going to do is we're also going to check to make sure we have a pull direction. So for those of you new to this area, pull direction is the direction that the tool is going to pull away from the part. And it's going to check a, a lot of the different areas in here. So here you can see I've got this little overview. It says a couple areas that I need to check for. And then we can click into these tabs. And what's nice about this is it highlights areas that I need to double check in and see if there's going to be problems. These are different areas that typically if you went to a manufacturer, they would say, hey, you need to change this. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, prevent that kind of back and forth that you're going to have with the manufacturing supplier and get you to fix some of those things up front um, before doing that. So hopefully this uh, decreases your time to market as you've fixed a lot of these, these uh, issues. So here you can see I've got this large thickness variation that is checking for. What's really nice about this is I can click here and it highlights in the graphics window and vice versa. If I click over here, it switches back and shows where, where it's highlighted here. So I can see what the problem is. And then really the probably one of the more powerful things that I've got here, and I'm gonna dock this here so everyone can see, is the ability to go down and see some recommendations. So the team's done a really good job of looking through what uh, manufacturers would recommend you do. And just having those, for those who are new to the, to the plastic injection molding process, we have some really nice features here on recommendations. So notice that not all the recommendations are necessarily, you know, go and change the model. They could be go and change uh, some of the rules. So maybe your rules are a little bit too tight and you can loosen them a little bit. The, the tools that we give you or the rules that we give you up front are, are pretty generic. Um, so, you know, you, you should take a look at that and maybe talk to your supplier about what kind of rules that they have for their, for their manufacturing process. So one of the things I like to point out is kind of this undercuts, right? So one of the things that talks about in undercuts is that uh, while those are, can be problematic, they can be created, those features can be created with these sliders um, uh, or lifters. So that's something where you can go to the manufacturer because in plastic injection molding, these kind of snap fit features are pretty common. And so with that, you could go to the manufacturer and say, hey, can we do this with sliders and lifters? They say, okay. You say, okay, that's, I, I'm glad it's still pointed that out because it, it could have been that I unintentionally made an undercut. But if I intentionally made it, you know, we, we want to go ahead and what you can do here is now go and ignore these alerts, right? So really nice feature that we got here. Again, it's also looking for draft. So making sure you have that minimum draft angle so that it can actually pull off the part. And then this knife edge. And so for those uh, unfamiliar, knife edges are, are part of the tool. And so if something gets too thin, right, or the features are too close together, so here it could possibly have possible knife edges. Here you could have possible knife edges. The tool just becomes really thin and long. And that causes a lot of wear on or premature wear on the tool. And so they, they would like it if you didn't make it that way. So just a couple different things to check. And this, again, really goes back to this design for manufacturing and making sure that your iterative process is just that much shorter um, going from the design to the manufacturing workspace. So that's what I have in the, in the uh, product design extension. And next, we're really going to talk about drawings. So drawings has gotten quite a bit of love in the past year, and they have just hit it out of the park again something users have been requesting for a while now is the ability to do whole tables. So we now have a new whole table. And here I can add in my origin point, much like whole tables that you've probably used before. Let's see if I can grab it. Okay, I'll just add it there. And this whole table is going to work much like uh, any other whole table or any other table in Fusion. So here you can see I've got my table here. I can go ahead and move it around. Uh, let's see if I can click it and then uh, move this here. And what's nice about this whole table is it does follow uh, whatever standard that you've chosen. So here I've, I've chosen ISO. So my descriptions are actually going to follow the ISO standards, which is really nice. Um, oh, did not mean to do that. 
the other thing that's kind of nice is it automatically creates uh, an origin. This origin also works for ordinate dimensions as well. So here you can see I've got an ordinate dimension. I can now come in here, select something, and it's gonna use that same origin. So nice little usability feature there. In addition to whole tables, we also have a new table type, which is this revision history table. So here you can see I already have revision history. Now this is out of the box fusion. You don't need a PDM system for this. This revision table just works uh, for anyone using fusion. It's a really nice way of keeping track of what you've changed and what, uh, what out on the shop floor has the different revisions and different changes in it. So here you can see I have my revision A. What's nice about this is I click here and I have this new dialog box. So it's a revision dialog box. Really nice features here. One of which is this ability to just add revisions. So I can add a revision, say I added a whole table here. I can go ahead, click in here and said add. Oh, here we go. Accidentally hit D. Add whole table, right? And there we go, we've got our revision going. What's nice about this as well is we can go ahead and actually hide older revisions if we want to, or come up here and say, I only want to see one, two, or three revisions at a time. And this will automate the process. So as, as many as you put in there, it'll hide it as soon as you've uh, you've gone over that number. What's really nice about this is in uh, older CAD, CAD packages, what would happen is you would have to start deleting out some of those rows, and then you would lose all that information. You'd have to go back to an older drawing to see what what that revision changed. Here, you're just hiding it. So if you wanted to see what happened in A again, you could come back here, click on A and see, okay, A was my initial release. Really nice functionality that we've got there as well. Uh, in addition to the actual table itself, obviously, if you are working with this, it'd be good to have revision markers. So here you can see it defaults to whatever is the latest, but also you can go back and whatever is visible here, uh, you will be able to create a revision marker for. So here I'm going to keep it at B, click over here, you can see my B revision marker, and you also have the nice ability to do revision clouds. So a couple of things just as a heads up that to be on the lookout for. Um, one, though, this revision cloud is not tied to anything. So if you go ahead and move a feature and already had a revision cloud, make sure that you go ahead and move that with whatever feature. It's not going to be tied to your view or your table. And going back to the whole table, those holes are only going to get picked up if they are whole features in the model. So make sure that when you're creating your holes, you're using whole features. That's what's going to be picked up to be used in your whole table. So with that, that is everything that is new in the design and documentation workspace. And I will hand it back over to Kieran. Thanks very much, Carl. That was awesome. Uh, the design advice absolutely blew my mind and the revision control, I'm sure a lot of the users and yourselves out there are gonna, gonna see huge benefit from that. Um, we did have a question come actually uh, from Devon and uh, this is you, Carl. He says, is the whole table and the revision table functions available with a core Fusion subscription or is it part of an extension? Yeah, not part of an extension, core Fusion, core Fusion stuff. Uh, I don't think we've really released anything in the drawing space yet um, besides stuff that goes with the manage extension, but all of this is all just core Fusion functionality get with base subscription. Brilliant, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, uh, we're actually gonna jump over to Dylan, who's gonna walk us through all of the cool stuff that's come in with what's new for the manufacturing workspace. So Dylan, over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Kieran and Kyle. So first, we're gonna jump into Fusion and Kieran alluded to earlier that there has been some changes in the repackaging of the manufacturing extension. And as part of that change, core users now have access to interactive tool orientation controls. This means, all of you core users out there now have more than you had before. If you're three plus one and three plus two users than you had before. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go through a couple of examples of three plus one and three plus two in the basic way we do it. And then the more advanced new capabilities that you now have access to. So firstly, tool orientation or three plus one, three plus two is used for a variety of different scenarios. It can be to more conveniently or more efficiently 
machine a piece of geometry. So in a simple sense, let's look at this planar face here. Now, to machine this in a three axis orientation to get a, a, a smooth surface finish, we'd need to do a number of step downs with a ball nose tool, which would be completely inefficient. By using tool orientation, we can machine this, this geometry here with the side of the tool or, or with the bottom of an end mill tool. And I'm gonna show you how to do that. So here are a few of the basic tools for tool orientation. Firstly, we have tool orientation reference from a planar face. When we say planar, we just mean a simply, a sim simply a flat face. So if I select this, I get a tool orientation which is perpendicular or normal to that selection. So we end up with a tool path that looks like that, a really efficient way to machine that bit of geometry. But of course, there's more than one way to do things. And here's another example of that. So this is us using, again, the basic tool orientation tools to align our tool orientation parallel with this linear edge. Now, again, when we select linear edges, opposite to when we select planar faces, we get a tool orientation which is parallel, running in exactly the same direction as that selection. So we get a tool path which looks like this. We're using the side of the end mill to, again, really efficiently machine that piece of geometry. And the final basic way to machine this, hit, or the, the final basic way to reference tool orientation is to reference via a true cylinder. That true cylinder can be uh, in the form of a hole or it can be in the form of an external spigot. It doesn't really matter. As long as it's a true cylinder, if we make that selection, we are going to get a tool orientation parallel to that cylinder selection. So they're the basic ways that we can do it. But of course, everyone here now has access to the more advanced interactive tool orientation controls. So let me show you exactly what they're about. Now, a more complex reason for needing tool orientation is something like this. Now, let's look at this component. And from the outset, it looks fairly simple. But upon further analysis, using accessibility analysis, funnily enough, we can see that there are undercut regions on this component. And that means that they are not accessible with a straight fluted tool from a three axis orientation. So our choices are to use something like a slot mill or a lollipop tool that has a bigger cutting diameter than the shank or more commonly use three plus one or three plus two. So we have to find a way to machine all of these regions that are undercut. So I'm gonna show you the ways that we can do that with the really, really advanced tools. So let's make a selection of our tool path, let's say a parallel tool path. And when we go to the tool orientation tab, you will see we have new options in here. The first that I wanna to talk to you about is something called surface normal. Now surface normal is a tool that allows us to hover our tool over 3D or 2D, but it's more beneficial for 3D. Um, 3D geometry and what we get is a dynamic interactive live tool orientation over the spot that we are hovering in. So as I move, you'll notice the, the line pointing off the end of the cursor changes. And this is because that tool, tool orientation normal point is changing with my cursor. So if I make a selection there, I get a tool orientation exactly normal to that selection. Now, when we are dealing with 3D freeform geometry, the old tool orientation tools they are very good or the basic tool orientation tool should I say they are very good and have their place they are however not suitable for components and situations like this so you now have a situation where you can take on much more complex work if you are doing three plus one or three plus two another really really useful feature in the interactive tool orientation is the drag and drop of the triads now if I take that and simply drag it, you'll see that my tool orientation is dynamically changing again as I drag and grab handles. You may also notice that I am getting a numerical change here as well, because this is signifying the, 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 the vector where my tool orientation is pointing. I can make numerical changes to fine tune that even further. On top of that, I have a tool called accessibility analysis within that tool orientation form. This tells me exactly what parts of the model are accessible from that specific tool orientation. So when you are dealing with complex 3D freeform models with a lot of undercuts, this tool is absolutely priceless.
Now to finish off, the final new tool you are getting for, for nothing is something called Align to View. Now, having the triads, drag and drop is amazing. Having surface normal is amazing, but we still lack that capability where we can see our perfect tool orientation, but don't have any geometry to conveniently reference from. This is where Align to View comes in. So what I can do, I can orientate my tool into a angle or an orientation, which I feel is absolutely perfect for my tool orientation to run normal to. You'll see this button here called Align to View. Keep an eye on the tool orientation or the work plane as I make this selection. We are now looking down the lens of the z-axis. So we have, a, we have a tool orientation that is perfectly normal to the camera view. Again, with the various components that have a lot of undercuts or a very, very free form and a very 3D, um, it's a super, super useful tool. Now we're gonna move into a, another demo and this is a tool path modification and this is called move entry positions now i'm sure there's been a point in time where everyone has wanted to move an entry position on a tool path within fusion 360 and has not had the ability the reasons you may want to do this is you may want to avoid leading in on mission critical faces or surface fit or fight or faces which desire a really good surface finish for application reasons and before we didn't have the ability to do this, and it has been asked for by hundreds and thousands of you Fusion 360 users. So let's look at a few situations. Here we have a steep and shallow toolpath, and my leading or my entry positions are going diagonally across the, the, the component. And this isn't really a, a big deal to me, but aesthetically, I want them moving perpendicular to this face here. And before there was absolutely no way we could have any control over this. What I can do now is select this button on the top of the ribbon. It brings up this UI here. And what we get is the ability to draw one or more points in space that intersect with closed sections of toolpath. And what we get back immediately is black dots on the intersection marks of the toolpath and the line we've, we've drew, letting us know that that's where our lead or our, our entry positions are going to be moved to. So if I make this selection, what happens in the background is Fusion 360 recalculates the leads and links, but it doesn't recalculate the entire toolpath. And that's really important because you're not gonna have to wait forever for this to have a think and come back with the appropriate result. You will now notice that them entry positions are exactly where I have just specified. Let's look at a couple of more examples. Here we have a chamfer tool, which is leading in on a plane, not plane of face, but an edge where the, the leading mark is going to be really, really visible. And we don't want that. What we want is to move that entry position onto a sharp corner, because that way we can hide that entry position. And we're, not, we're never going to know it even happened. So we go move entry positions and we simply get a little bit closer to that corner, make the intersection there or thereabouts on the corner. And again, it goes away, has a think, does the leads and links, but doesn't recalculate the entire toolpath and comes back in record speed. We think about the last, um, the, the, the last example here, and this is not aesthetic, this is safety, this is tool life, and this is not wanting to break tools. So we can see here that our tool is leading in, 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 in a corner of an internal pocket. Now, typically we will rough out a pocket with a tool which has a diameter bigger than the smallest corner on our component. So there's a good chance within this pocket, we're gonna have excess stock. The problem there is as our tool leads into that corner with excess stock, we are going to get over engagement, severe, severe vibration. At a best case scenario, we're gonna get a poor surface finish. In the worst case scenario, we are going to get a broken tool, potentially costing you hundreds of dollars. What we can simply do again is select move entry positions and we can make one selection through closed sections of toolpath. And we're gonna move that entry position from that internal corner to a planar face where there is no excess stock and we know exactly what stock conditions are there. And we have just saved ourselves a couple of hundred dollars from not breaking our tool within that internal corner. Now let's look at the final demo that we have for you today. And this is another toolpath modification which lives within our machining extension. And it is a toolpath trim. 
and it, this is this is via the form of trim via boundary and trim via plane. So in this button at the top in our modify section of the ribbon, we have a consolidated user interface which has a variety of different toolpath trimming mechanisms. The one that we have had for a long time is something called trim via polygon, which allows us to draw points in space and we're going to keep whatever's inside, outside or both. And the two new ones that we have as of this March 2022 release are trim by a curve and trim by a boundary. So before we get into the trim and let me tee up the scenario where is into where this may be useful for you. So I've made this toolpath and I have ignored, the, I've, I've avoided the flat regions, um, but I've machined everything else. Upon closer inspection, I've quickly realized that I do not want to machine this internal bit here. The reason is I'm using a ball nose tool and these are sharp corners. And by nature, if I machine them corners with a ball nose tool, the natural radius of the tool is going to leave excess stock in there, forcing me to go in with further operations, which is a complete waste of time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get rid of that stock in the middle. And the quickest, most convenient way for me to do that is to use the newest form of toolpath trimming, trim via contour. We simply make a selection of a closed contour exactly the way we do with stock contour selection or a machine, machining boundary selection. We can offset positively or negatively. We don't need to in this case. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to keep everything that is outside. So like all toolpath modifications, it doesn't recalculate the entire toolpath. All it does is recalculate the leads and links. And it's a really important thing to remember because that's why it works as, as, as quick as it does. So now we have a toolpath which looks reasonable. My aim is to machine this fairly large chamfer on the outside. But if we look just a little bit closer, we still have inefficiency in this toolpath. And of course, everyone knows that wasted time on the machine is costing us money. So if I make this selection on the top here, turn that off, what you will see is that we have a few passes where our tool is doing absolutely nothing. So I wanna make sure that this toolpath is, is as efficient as possible. So again, I can use another one of the new toolpath modifications and this is trim via plane. So I make a selection of, the, of, a, of a planar face and I have this ability here to drag and drop or, or, or drag the plane, should I say. And we've seen a dynamic preview of red and blue toolpath. Now you've probably guessed it, but the red is what's leaving us and the blue is what's staying. In this case, it's, gone the wrong way around so we go from side one to side two and I don't want to just drag and guess I want to put a numerical input in there something that I believe is correct so we're minus four millimeters and we okay that and as this thinks about it and recalculates the leads and links um, something important to note is that these modifications are stored on the timeline at the bottom so let's look at our new and improved more efficient toolpath Unfortunately for us, we appear to have made a mistake. We've made a mistake. We've took too much toolpath off. We now have an over of the engagement angle and we are missing stock at the top. Fortunately for us, again, our modifications are all stored within the timeline. So we can go edit. I can manually change that four millimeters to two. Okay and it's gonna give us back something which is as efficient as humanly possible for this situation. So we've gone from having one of the most inefficient toolpaths that we could have possibly had where it needed further rest machining to something which does exactly what we need. It's gonna give us the result we want and it has as little cut in time as we could have got it down to. And with that, that is my section done. If there are any questions in the chat, I am more than happy to take them. And I believe it is Back to Kieran. Thanks very much, Dill. Um, we actually, uh, I mean, that was amazing. Thanks very much. The, the trim to curve and boundary is, is just so useful for efficient programming and reducing machining time and programming time. And then, then the move entry positions you just showed just, just mean that, that you guys out there can get a, get, get a significantly better surface finish just by moving some of those entry points. Now, talking about entry points, Glenn actually had quite a good question. He said, um, you know, are we able to set the exit points the same way we do the entry points? Yes, tra traditionally. So on the contour example that I've shown, 
um, when we define the entry positions, the exit positions are going to be identical. If you are asking if we can set them separately at the moment, Glenn, there's two different objects. Unfortunately, um, we cannot, I do not believe. But let me look into that further for you, Glenn. Great question. And, and but I believe it is just the entry positions and I'll default for, for, for both. But yeah, good question nonetheless. Thanks, thanks, Dill. And then kind of a, a question um, from uh, Cody really is, is the move entry position feature part of the, the machining extension or part of the base Fusion 360 core offering? That's a good question as well. So Kieran spoke about the, the something at the start, the extension repackaging and all of our toolpath modifications. So anything which is modified post toolpath calculation, is put into the machine extension. Um, so to answer your question shortly, yes, move entry positions is in the machine extension. Brilliant, excellent. Well, thanks very much, uh, Dil. Uh, Edwin, uh, this is an exciting part. It's the electronics workspace. Um, why don't you walk us through some of the exciting things that, that are in there? Thank you, Keelan, I really appreciate it. And Dylan, phenomenal work, man. That was a great presentation. So let me go ahead and share my screen and tell you a little bit about what's the latest updates on Fusion 360 and the electronic design capabilities available in Fusion 360. You know, when you're working with your schematic for the very, very first time, you always have to find the right component that you need for your design. And Fusion 360 Electronics includes an ocean full of components that are available by our team of librarians, as well as contributed by our partners. Now, navigating these, these libraries and these repositories was rather complicated to be able to pinpoint the right component that you're looking for. Well, in this, in this update, you're gonna notice that now when you're gonna begin adding components to your design, you're gonna see now the new place component panel. Okay, on the place component panel, it's actually gonna be a panel that remains permanently in your design workspace. In other words, it's not that modal dialog box, which was actually in the way of your, um, of your design workspace. In addition to that, you're gonna be able to now use, uh, be able to see what is the source of the component coming from. Is it a local library? Is it a contributed library? Is it a team library? Or is it a managed library that you're using maybe from our repository or from your own repository? Especially if you're a Eagle user and you're using managed libraries, this will actually filter those libraries as well. That way you could make use of them for you as well as your team as well. In addition to that, when you select components now, you're gonna notice that on the bottom of the screen, you actually get the symbol as well as the footprint and the 3D model. There's three ways of viewing it. You could view it long ways, that way you get a better idea with better details. But in addition to this, I'd like to let you know to point out that you actually have all of the metadata for the component that you're actually selecting. So if there's any links to the data sheets or any other details in the metadata of that component, they're actually available. In addition to this, you could actually look for all the libraries as I have already selected here, or I could specify to a particular library. So I could say, I wanna go to a particular library and go to, let's say my diodes only, for example, or my display LEDs. I could go to that library by itself. Now, everything is about being able to preview it and view it. And many components actually have multiple variants. In other words, you could have different leads for the same component. Well, being able to preview those variants were kind of difficult on the earlier version of, of adding components to your schematic. So what we did is that we've made it possible for you to expand the variants and actually visualize them as you could see here as well. So not only you see the footprint, you actually are seeing the 3D model of the component. Once you select the component, you could go ahead and drag it into your component. So let me just go ahead and put all of the components in use. And I'm just gonna use a look look up for a USB connector that I need for my design. I'll highlight some of the connectors that come up and I could actually see them which ones I want. I'm actually looking for one that only has surface mount pads. And as you could see, I could actually see it. It only has surface mount pads, but I don't wanna drill any holes on this board as you could see. So it was this easy for me to actually find that component. I click and drag it into the design space 
as you can see, it's attached to my mouse cursor. And then I could just go ahead and flip it around and place it where I need it. As you can see, it's that easy. Now, um, of course, you always get the next one attached to your mouse cursor. I could go back to the panel, select another component, or just go ahead and escape out as well from here as well. Now, coupled with the new um, place component panel, we actually made some great improvements towards the library manager. What happens, as I told you earlier, we have many um, companies that are many of our team as well as partners contributing to the amount of libraries that we currently have in Fusion 360. And navigating all of those uh, libraries was actually rather difficult. Actually finding the library that you wanted was rather challenging. Not only because you were only seeing the title of the library, but you couldn't see the content of the library. So before you actually put it in use, it was uh, a little bit on the hard side. Well, in this version, we actually fixed that. So first of all, um, I could select if I only want to see the libraries that are available on my managed libraries. Let's say, for example, library.io. And if I have a team that is contributing to a managed library, I could actually see the different teams that I'm going, that I'm contributing with, and I could select the specific team I want to go to directly. In addition to this, I have those partners that we have, and I'll select Worth Electronics here, and I want to be able to see the content of that library before I actually put it in use. Before we had to kind of like guess it, put it in use and actually put it in use. Well, now with this update, you actually could highlight the library that you're interested in, and you will see the schematic symbols that are available for that component, as well as the 3D models that are available for that component. So being able to find the library and the right component, it's gonna be a real time saver for you because you no longer have to be guessing which library has a part you want. It's so much easier now to pinpoint the ones that you want. And I like to strongly recommend that you always go ahead and go to the update available because this is gonna let you know what libraries have been recently updated. In this case, it's only using Worth Electronics, but I'll go ahead and select all managed folders or all my libraries and I'll select Fusion as well as my local disk. So it's gonna let me know all of the libraries that are updated, which I could just go ahead and click on there and select them and get that update. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and move on from the library editor. I'm sorry, from the library panels. Now let's go over to <clears throat> um, a feature that has been enjoyed by Eagle users and they will now be able to take benefit of it in Fusion 360 and that's called design blocks. Also referred a lot of times as design reuse. Instead of actually relay out that buck, uh, that buck voltage or that uh, analog to digital converter that you already did, or maybe if you're in the sound industry, you already have a multi-channel system. Instead of having to lay out eight channels, you could lay out one and just go ahead and reuse it. And we refer to that as design blocks. Under the new, under the place dial, uh, under the place menu, you're gonna see that we now have a system called insert design blocks. Now, right now, this is 100% compatible with design blocks that you've created in Eagle. So if I go, if I navigate to my Eagle folder, um, it's design blocks, I have it right here. Let's say I, I'm, I want, you know, I'm using USB, so I'm using five volts, as you could see. I could go ahead and click on open, and now I have that design block attached to my mouse cursor. But before I attach it, if there's collisions in regards of names, and net names as well as component names, it actually lets me know that it's gonna be renaming portions of that schematic. That way it resolves it. And that's gonna be the resulting name of the new, comp of the new components in that block. And I could click okay with that solve. And it's gonna be, as you could see, attached to my mouse cursor right there. And I could go ahead and place that there as well. But we went a step further on this. Besides adding design blocks from, few, uh, from Autodesk Eagle, we now can actually use sub-circuits based on other schematics that you've done in Fusion 360 Electronics. So under the same place uh, drop-down menu, you're gonna notice that we have insert schematics. This allows me, that. let me go ahead and create a brand new sheet because this is gonna be kind of a big one. I'm gonna create a brand new schematic sheet there in the bottom and I'm gonna select insert schematic. And I'm gonna select a schematic they already have as you could see here. 
again, it's looking for any collisions of existing names of my schematics and it's resolving them for me and it's letting you know in case you need to edit it for any reason. I could go ahead and click OK. And in a few seconds, you're going to notice that, that, that now this schematic is attached to my mouse cursor. So in this case, I'm using an HDMI interface in which I wanted to add to this design. And instead of having the, me the relay out that entire HDMI interface, I'm able to just select one that I already have and actually add it to my design. This is gonna save you so much time. That way it becomes modular designing instead of designing uh, part by part as well. Now, now that I've told you a little bit of the design blocks, let's go ahead and move over to the uh, circuit board design. Now on the circuit board design, the first thing I wanna show you is, you know, the benefit of working with Fusion 360 is that you have 3D models. You're actually working with a lot of, it's all about 3D modeling now. And it's so much easier when you're working with 3D models as well, um, because you actually have a realistic view of what's going on on the design. So let me just go ahead and move this part that I added. Let's go ahead and move this part real quick. And you select the component and just add it to my design. I'll just add it right here. Okay. Actually, I wanted to add it right over here. Let me just go ahead and move this real quick. Sorry about that. So I just want to add it right there. Okay. Now, when it comes to uh, creating a 3D model of your circuit board, it's always a really good idea because it lets you know uh, what your board is going to look like realistically. But there are times that when you push your um, and you want to use components that actually have assigned 3D models to them. But there will be times that all of a sudden you see that a component shows up in your 3D model and it just has like this rectangular gray square box on it. Um, and you'll see in a moment as it renders really quick. I'm sorry, while it loads the 3D models. And this is actually wanted to let you know something about this and I'll do this right after this. So as you could see, this USB actually came in as a, a rectangular box, just letting me know that, look, there's not a 3D model assigned to that component. So it doesn't know exactly what it is. So it just puts a box and it's using the outline of the component, which would be the silt screen as the values being used to create this box. Well, wouldn't it be nice to be able to see which components have 3D models before I actually push it to a 3D model? Well, that's what we did in this version. What we did is that now when you're going to push a 3D, you're going to notice that in the dialog box, I could go ahead and expand the PC components. And the ones that have the yellow alerts are letting me know which ones do not have a 3D model. Okay. And there's two ways you could solve this. You could either edit the library where that component exists. Or you could just go ahead, oops, I went back to it, okay. Or you could just go ahead and go to that component and from the context menu, you could add a custom 3D model directly in the schematic or on the circuit board, okay? So you don't have to go all the way to the library and edit the library. You could actually assign 3D models directly here. And this is a feature we've had for a little while. I just wanted to let you know, if you don't have a 3D model, how actually you could solve that. Now, as you already saw, moving over to the uh, 3D PCB, we got a lot of notifications from many users telling us that when they had boards and schematics that had really large amount of holes or maybe some large holes or VS for VS stitching, the, uh, creating the 3D model would take a significant amount of time. Well, we actually did a lot of work on this, our developers, and now that time has been reduced on average a 25%, but we noticed that some designs actually were able to improve their performance almost 90%. So it's actually quite significant what we've done. Now, I'm gonna go move over to the library editor. Even though Fusion 360 has lots of libraries available for you to select from, there'll always be instances that you might just have to create your own component. It just happens. And making components is always one of those tasks that we don't really like, but Fusion 360 actually makes it a lot of fun. And I'm gonna show you because in the library editor, we have a workspace called the package workspace. And this workspace actually has tons of all of the IPC compliant templates that are available. The only thing you need to do is select the template that you need, put in the mechanical details, 
and it actually creates a component. And we did this quite a bit, a long time ago. But what I wanna show you here is that for DFM, which we actually have three templates, what we've done is that the footprint, which is um, uh, interpreted by these construction lines, I do now have the option to round them off. So from rectangle pad shapes, I could go to rounded pad shapes and I could go ahead and update that. And the only reason we did this is that a lot of times when it comes to the, depending on the way you're soldering components to your circuit board, sometimes instead of having the sharp corners as leads on your circuit board, it's best to have rounded edges. I usually use rounded edges because I almost bake everything. I'm really bad at manually routing. I'm sorry, manually soldering. So I just use my reflow of in the usually time. So for all three of DFMs, now you're gonna have that option. Now for sockets, we did something kind of similar as well. You know, sockets give you that flexibility on your circuit board to be able to, to you know, change firmware or change functionality on the circuit board by just simply changing a chip. And we only had at the moment with a round pad. So it's kind of limiting what you would be able to order when you wanted to order that EEPROM that you needed to use on your design board. So what we did was that to make this, you know, that way it's easier for you when you're going to DG Key or JMCO to order your parts. Now you could use uh, double leaf. So on the lead shapes, you're gonna see where it says rectangle. And if I go ahead and then update, now you're gonna notice that we have those dual, dual leaf compression style leads. So this actually expands a lot more of the type of EEPROMs you're gonna be using in your next design. This makes it that much easier for you to navigate. And I'm gonna finish going back to the board. And I'm gonna to go to what we refer to as the CAM processor. So I'll go to manufacturing and I'll go to the CAM processor. In our CAM processor, what we've done is that we created, we already had where it says a section, as you see, we have the Gerber files, ODB++, and we actually have image. What we did here is that we actually added one called PDF. We had bitmap and JPEG and PNG compressions. Now we've added PDF because we feel that this is more of a compatible format that many more manufacturers are gonna be able to use. After I select the actually output I wish to use, I could right click it and select, you know, create a brand, brand new image and I could select which layers I wanna use. In this case, I'm just gonna use the top silk screen layers as well as I put some documentation when it comes to measurements on the board. I put them on the document layer. So let me see if I could quickly find that right here, the document layer and I'll click okay. And as you could see, my measurements come up. Now, when I click on process job, not only it's gonna create the smart ODB++ outputs, as well as the Gerber files, it's gonna create a set of images for my illustrations, giving you some manufacturing data as well. Well, thank you for the opportunity, greatly appreciate it. I'm pretty sure this is gonna really truly optimize and reduce your time to market with next time you're using Fusion 360 electronics. Thank you for allowing me to present and you guys have a great one. If there are any questions, I would love to take care of them. Thanks very much, Edwin. That was that was amazing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm always blown away how easy you make what can be sometimes a quite a, a complicated um, industry. And, uh, you know, <laughs> Fusion 360's tools just, just make it look so easy. You know, everything from the place component panel being now the one source of truth for, for all your component details. And um, the design manager now just makes it so much more powerful to, to navigate through the, the correct libraries. And, you know, we're now seeing things every, everywhere from preview schematics to the footprints to the 3D models. Um, it's really, really encouraging. And I'm sure our users and, and yourselves out there are, are gonna see the benefit of this. Um, we did have a question from Ryan and Ryan says, are there any plans to add Autodesk Vault support to Eagle for revision control and tracking in the future, whether that's near, far, uh, or further into the future? I haven't, to be really honest with you, I wouldn't, I don't, well, when it comes to Eagle, I'm pretty sure there will not be any Vault support. Um, if there was going to be any support, it would be maybe towards the direction of, of uh, a Fusion 360 electronics. Um, but I haven't heard anything about that as at the moment. I'm not aware of it right now. Right. But we'll try to dig into it and maybe I'll try to find out some more. But I haven't, and at least where, where we're at, no, I haven't heard anything about it. Super. Okay, and with that, what I'd like to do is kind of just, as we come to kind of the, the last bit of the presentation, I just want to kind of um, talk about the Insider program a little bit. And those of you that are familiar, 
uh, with it. And uh, the, the Insider program really aims to give yourselves access to the public facing versions of Fusion 360 a couple of weeks, usually between two or three weeks before it goes live to the general public. Um, one, to get your hands on it and, and two, to test things out for yourselves and provide feedback to us. Um, so it's a really great opportunity for yourselves to be involved. You get um, you, you have a lot of Autodesk employees who are who are on the Insider um, Lounge or program, and they and you get to interact with them consistently about questions you have, wishes, problems you're experiencing. Um, so it allows us to kind of iron out all of these problems prior to the full release of the product. So those of you that do want to join, there is a link at the bottom. And going forward, if you do join, you'll get access to all of the pre-release. Um, what we call the inside or the pre-production version two or maybe even three weeks before the, the general release to the public. So it's a, it's a really good opportunity to engage with us um, and to be part of a wider community as well. So, um, so go sign up to that link. And I think we're almost kind of on, on the button. So just want to kind of cover those three things again that we spoke about um, in the design workspace. We've got the design advice that Carl covered. We've got the manufacturing extension enhancements, things like the um, move start points and the, the, the plane and boundary trimming functionality. And then we've got the, the awesome component panel that Edwin just showed us as well, um, along with the package generator as well. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time. Um, it, was, it was amazing having you guys here. We're really excited because it's, it's generally one of our first um, presentations where we're delivering the SWATs new live to the public. So thanks for your time. Um, just trying to see, uh, Devin asked the question about ITAR compliancy. Uh, I think that's quite a larger question and a discussion we can have uh, offline, Devin. It is something we're definitely working on, something we're looking at, and something that's been actively worked on by Autodesk. Um, so uh, feel free to reach out to me, Devin, if, if you want some more information. We can have a chat about that offline as well. Um, And then just kind of picking up on the last couple of things, uh, what is on the radar for probing? Um, is there any plans to allow fourth axis 2D contour to uh, support and 3D, uh, 360 degree rotation? Uh, so the honest answer is I don't quite know what's on the roadmap for the probing development. Um, that's something I can certainly look into, Peter, um, and uh, I can get back to you on that. So uh, I do have your, your details here, so I can always drop you an email separately. Is it worth us uh, answering the one about 2D contour? Um, so the question from Peter is, is there plans to allow four axis 2D contour to support a 360 degree rotation? I, can you achieve that with RAP, Peter, or, or are you already referring to RAP? Um, I'd be interested in because you can get a f something which is useful on a fourth axis with a 2D contour, a 2D adaptive and 2D pocket. And I, I think basically, I don't want to keep everyone longer than they need to, but Spencer posted a link, the Menti link in the chat, uh, just to let us know what you thought of the presentation, kind of helps us tailor this for, for future presentation. We will run this continuously uh, over the next couple of months. So whenever a new product, whenever we release a new what's new, hey, you're going to get an email. So sign up and uh, you'll see our, our faces on here uh, going forward. So with that, Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thanks for, for participating. And uh, to the presenters, um, the, the experts, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. And uh, everyone out there, have a lovely day and see you, see you for the next release. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.